Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and our Lord Jesus the Christ. It was 1953, we had just gone on a rather wonderful cruise from Germany to the United States, landed at Ellis Island after 11 days, and when we landed at Ellis Island, we finally took care of our suitcases and boxes, and, and we were ready to make our trip to South Dakota. Before we did that, we went to a little restaurant that was in Grand Central Station in New York City. And while we were in that restaurant, five of us sitting around the table, something happened that is not unusual to you and me at this point in my life. But at that time, it was very unusual because the waitress brought each one of us a glass of water and silverware. And we thought to ourselves, why would the waitress bring bring us a glass of water. Well, in Germany, you just don't order water. Even to this day, if you want to drink water, it's very difficult to get just plain water. Germans like to drink this, this Sprudelwasser, which is sort of bubbling kind of water. And we were over there, maybe these Germans need more bubbling water. I don't know. But in any case, we were there, and they brought us the water. We were trying to figure out why they would do that. But in Germany, you have, would have to pay for it, here they just were bringing it to us. And then one of us, I don't remember who it was, came up with a bright idea, said, you know, sometimes in Germany, you can order a glass of water, and you can also order some concentrated fruit juices, and you can mix the water and the con concentrated fruit juices in the water. And wow, right there on the table, there was a yellow bottle, and there was a red bottle, and obviously, the Americans, in their, with their generosity, have provided for us free of charge lemon juice and ketchup. But we thought it was cherry juice, but we found out it didn't. We were strangers in a strange land. It was just sort of an illustration, just one example of the many ways in which we had to adapt ourselves to life in the United States without really knowing what, often not knowing what we were doing. When you're a stranger in a strange land, you have strange experiences. But I want us to, for a moment, not just focus on the strange experiences that you and I might have, but I want us to focus on what is written in Scripture, for example, in the first book of Peter, the second chapter, the 11th verse, what does it say? You and I are aliens and strangers. We are foreigners in a strange land. Or in Philippians, we find written that our citizenship is not here on earth, but our citizenship is in heaven. And you can go through scripture again and again, whether the Old Testament or the New Testament, and there's one theme that comes and reoccurs, and that theme is that we, as followers of God, as Christian believers, we are strangers in a strange land. And when you're a stranger in a strange land, you have strange experiences, as I mentioned before, and other people will also see you as if you were somehow strange. And there's a tremendous pressure not to be different than the other people. But the text for today helps us understand something that I think you and I can so easily forget or can so easily skip over. We have so acclimated ourselves to the culture that we live in that we often don't see any difference between ourselves and other people, between ourselves as followers of Christ and those who are not following Christ. And yet there is such a difference, and it's important for us to get a handle on it. Let me read to you not just from the portion of the Gospel that was selected for this day, but let me read to you some of the verses that follow. And pay attention, if I might ask you to do that, to the, to the, the uh, prepositions that are being used, because I think it will help us. In the ninth verse of the 17th chapter, according to St. John, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world. He may love the world, but he's not praying for the world. He's not praying for those uh, perspectives, for those persons who are opposed to what God is doing through Jesus Christ. That's the world. That's at least the way John is using the word world here. But for those you have given me, for they are yours, all I have is yours, and all you have 
satisfied and glory has come to me through them, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still, they, the disciples, and later on he includes us, they are still in the world and I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. And then he goes on, I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Are you getting tired of hearing all of this in the world, out of the world, of the world? But I think in a few moments I hope it will make some sense. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth as you sent me into the world. I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. So what is John saying? What is Jesus saying in his prayer? He's making a distinction, which many authors have picked up, and one of the authors who is excellent on this issue is an author by the name of Paul Borthwick, who's written a book called The Mindful Missions. And he makes a distinction between two types of Christians. First of all, he talks about worldly Christians. Those are the Christians who are both in the world and who are of the world. They are the Christians who say, yes, I believe in Jesus, yes, I believe in salvation, but continue to live their lives as if Jesus really didn't exist in their lives. They are the Christians whose perspective cannot be differentiated from many, by anybody else's perspective. So worldly Christians are Christians who are both in the world and of the world, whereas world Christians, according to Northway, world Christians are in the world, but they are not of the world. Let me see if I can make this a little clearer. I was struggling with this text and trying to sort of wrap my mind around it when I looked or I watched, not for the purpose of the text, but when I watched 60 Minutes. Stick with me here for a moment. Now, 60 minutes, did you see 60 Minutes this past Sunday? Okay, one person did. They had a program where they were talking about a new therapy for soldiers who were coming back from Iraq and from Afghanistan who were experiencing what they call a survivor syndrome. Does that mean anything to anyone here? Survivor syndrome? They are people who had lost buddies during the war. We're now experiencing a post-traumatic stress disease or syndrome. And they were having a difficult dealing time dealing with the fact that they had survived, but their buddies had not. And when I listened to that, and Karen and I watched it, I said to her, I said, that's hard for me to understand. You'd think that somebody under those circumstances who has survived would be thankful, and perhaps they would. But they were struggling with the fact that they were living and their buddies were not. And I was trying to understand why is it that they would feel guilt? Why would it, is it that they would somehow or another feel that they had were at fault or they had done something or failed to do something that they should have? And then I watched another program. And I purposely watched this program. I purposely tried to find it was by Simon Sinek. And Simon Sinek had done interviews with hundreds of soldiers. And he found again and again the same thing. Here were people who were feeling guilty because their buddies had died. And they would ask him, why? And something that happened during these interviews that sort of made a light bulb go off in his mind. And something, as I was listening to this, turned a light bulb on for me. There is within the army and the armed forces a culture which is different than the rest of the culture in the United States. Again and again he found the answer, Simon found the answer from the soldiers, and the answer was they felt that their buddy would have done the same thing for them. Let me see if I can clarify. 
Some said I interviewed one particular person by the name of Captain William Swenson. He was the first person since the Vietnamese War to receive the Medal of Honor without having died. And he had been on patrol in September 8, 2009, helping some soldiers who were American soldiers and some Afghan soldiers, and they were trying to protect a group of villagers who were making decisions. And they were attacked from three different sides. And pictures were shown, movies were shown, that about what Captain Swenson had done. He had heroically saved a number of people, just brought them from under the worst fire into the helicopters. And on one occasion, there was even a picture where he leaned down and kissed the forehead of one of the soldiers, and then turned around immediately back into to get more soldiers, to rescue more soldiers. And Simon makes the comment. He says, in the army, he says, you get a medal for sacrificing yourself. You see, in the army, there's a culture of sacrifice and service. In fact, the armed services are called services. There's a culture of sacrifice and service that doesn't exist in the rest of our culture. There's a way of relating to one another, where people are dependent upon one another, where people are, in so many words, there for each other, even if that means that you might die and lose your life. Because the army has built up, or the armed services have built up this kind of culture. And it creates bonds between the soldiers that are extremely strong. I remember when Karen's father was still alive, he was a Marine, when Karen's father was still alive, he would talk about his buddies in the most incredible, loving terms and how much they meant to him. And I think it's all because there was this culture of sacrifice and service. Now stop there for a moment. Let's switch to the banking scandal of 2008, 2009, 2010. Remember, in the Army, you get a medal if you are willing to sacrifice, if you sac sacrifice yourself. In the banking business, you get a bonus if you can sacrifice somebody else. You get a bonus if the people who are working under you can be sacrificed towards your end, towards your goal. There is a culture in our society of self-promotion and selfishness which doesn't exist in the army. There's a culture of self-centered promotions, which is very different. Now let's switch back to worldly Christians and world Christians. You see, I'm convinced that you and I as Christians are called to live in a culture which is closer to the culture that exists in the armed services, that is a culture of sacrifice and service, than we are as Christians called to be successful in our business world, where quite often, in a rapturous kind of way, People are sacrificed for your own goals. And even in the VA scandal that we have going on right now, one of the commentators, informed commentators, was suggesting that the reason you have this scandal going on is because they were promising bonuses as long as you have the right numbers, regardless of the impact that that might have on the health and welfare of the person. As long as I can make these numbers fit, even if I have to do it fraudulently or misrepresent the truth, even if I have to sacrifice some people under me, even if they get fired, as long as I can meet my standards, then I will get a bonus. Now, to be a world Christian, a Christian who is in the world, but not of the world, who has not yet been persuaded or will never be persuaded to uh, actually live his life or her life by the standards of the world. A worldly Christian, in the world, of the world. A world Christian, I get this confused yet, yeah. a world Christian is someone who lives in the world, but lives here by a different standard than the world. So where does that take us? Here we have Jesus praying. He is getting ready to leave, or at least he's getting ready to be crucified and to be raised from the dead. He's having this conversation 
with the disciples. What does this leave us? I think, well, let me speak for myself. I find it extremely easy to slip from being a world Christian to being a worldly Christian. I think it's very easy for us to assume that the standards of the world, everybody should live by. I think it's very easy for us to evaluate our worth in terms of the possessions we have or the power that we can exercise. I think it's very easy for us as Christians to walk around and forget that we are called to sacrifice, forget that we are called to love others, forget the fact that Jesus has called us to be his followers and not to be the follower of some other philosophy or some other business guru. There's a story that Søren Kierkegaard tells. He is an 1800, early 1800s, a Lutheran theologian from Denmark, and he talks about it as a parable of the geese. And he talks about the fact that when he was growing up, he had geese and they had a farm and he had geese. And these geese were living the life of writing. Well, I guess in Denmark he didn't live a life of writing, but so to speak, they were living you know, this wonderful life. They could eat whenever they ate, they just gorged themselves all the food that they could possibly get. And they probably thought they were very happy without ever remembering that they were destined for somebody's team. They were domesticated geese. Every year when the geese would fly over the barnyard on their way south, you could see, he said, the geese, some of the geese would try to run and, and fly and fly with the, with the whatever group of geese are called. What a group of geese called? Why? A gaggle? Okay, I thought I had problems with the word, the world, and the world in, and the world out. Okay, a gaggle. This gaggle of geese would be flying around, and you could see the other geese trying to catch up, but they couldn't make it. Because they were domestic. They were living by a different state. He said, and then one year, he said, he saw a wild goose who landed in the barnyard. He said, and I imagine that the wild goose had it as its goal to help the other geese to know what it was like to live a wild life. And what did the goose do? He started eating with the other geese, getting fatter and fatter. And when it came time to fly south with the other geese, he couldn't be. You see, it's very easy for us as wild Christians to become domestic. It's very easy for us to live a life of a worldly Christian, even if we've been committed as a world Christian. So what do we do about this? What's the solution? Do we just sort of pass legislation? Do we enforce attendance in a different way when it comes to church attendance? Do we require people to work in a specific way? What's the solution? Well, I think the first solution is to recognize, or the first step of the solution, is to recognize that we can so easily be caught up in the worldly standards of what it means to be alive and forget about what Jesus is telling us when he asks us to come and follow him, to, when he calls us to himself and when he calls us to follow him. So that's the first step, is to recognize the problem. The second step, I think, is to make a decision that we will again and again, only with God's help, that we will again and again follow Jesus to be in the world, but not of the world. And the third step is for us to once again, as a congregation, do what I think this congregation has so frequently done, has so often done, and that is help. You remember Paul Riedel? I had the opportunity when he was sick to get to know the family and one of the members that I got to know was Dave and one of his sisters, I can't remember which one it was, but anyway, we were talking. And he was just sort of recollecting and thinking back about all the times 
in which people in this congregation helped each other when there was a need. He said it would be nothing for his father to say, hey, so-and-so down the road needs something. Let's get together and help that person. The congregation, the parents, modeled for each other what it means to be a servant. And I think we once again, and I, it's happening, I know it happens much more. I look out, look out on the faces of the congregation, and I know it happens many, many times that I'm not aware of, and I'm aware of many of the times when people are helping each other. But I think consciously, consciously, we need to resolve that we will model for each other and for our children what it means to be a servant. How recently when, when members in this congregation, father and children, sons, help somebody with some wood and, and, some, and some sticks and gold, whatever those things are. What? Brush? Brush. Thank you. So, we need to consciously model that for one another. Finally, Finally, you and I need to pray to our Father just as Jesus prayed. I once read a story about Native Americans. And the Native Americans decided that they would usher in their young boys into adulthood, to usher them into adulthood in a particular way. And what they would do is train them year after year after year until they were 12 years old. And all sorts of skills in tracking and fishing hunting and using a bow and arrow, whatever the means of defending yourself uh, were available. And once a person had passed all of those tests at the age of 12 on his birthday, in the dead of night, when it was extremely dark, the 12-year-old would be taken to the center of the forest, where it was dark and nobody could see, and would be left there. They would take him there blindfolded and then would take the blindfold off and then the adults would disappear. Can you imagine being 12 years old in the middle of the dense, deep forest where you can't even see the hand in front of your eyes when you hear a twig break, where you hear a roar of some animal? Can you imagine how scary that might be? Maybe you can but I wouldn't want to do it now. And so here they would be, scared to death. And in the morning, as the light would begin to creep into the day, they would begin to look out and see just next to them, just about five or six feet from them, a figure with a bow and arrow. Was the father of the wicked man. You see, regardless of how old you and I are, we need fathers to defend us. And that's why Jesus, that's why Jesus is praying for the Father. For us to stay in the world, but not be of it. To live by a different culture. 